Um, welcome to the Boburg Institute and to the sixth lecture in our series, Times of Festivals, Festival. I'm Eckhard Marchand, organizer and convener of this lecture series, and I'm a member of the Bilderfahrzeuge Research Group at the Boburg Institute. Festivals, um, as to the topic of our um, series, festivals, whether standalone or recurrent ones, frequently harbor temporal disjunctions as they preserve old, elsewhere out of date art forms or foster the development of new uh, genres. As we have heard in the previous um, seven lectures, uh, five lectures um, by art historians, social political historians and musicologists. Um, in several of our lectures, we saw how perhaps unsurprisingly, many of these changes seemed to serve the interest of ruling elites. Apparently in line with this at the very beginning of the series, musicologist Michael Fendt, when looking at three festivals from the 16th to the 20th century, argued that an increasing concern for brotherhood and social equality expressed in the events that he was looking at um, was not actually met by the chosen art musical forms employed. Um, that seemed to be presenting a different development. At the same time, um, several of our lectures, and even more so the, the discussions afterwards, um, presented an increasing concern for alternative readings and experiences of um, festivals and their imagery, um, readings and experiences that were not directly controlled or sanctioned by the ruling powers. Our topic is, of course, um, a Vian one drawing on Burkhardt's notion of the festival, das, um, das Festwesen, as an area of transition between life and art, um, Elbi Warburg saw festivals and the festlich bewegtes Leben, the festively moving life of Renaissance Italy, as the place where artists turned to the gestures and expressive formula forged by their colleagues in antiquity, as Warburg put it. Thus, for, um, for Warburg, the festival was the place where the generative potential of ancient gestures and, and visual formula or pathos formula came to the fore. Babuk's um, study of the life of images as a, as a history of human expression um, is of relevance for the historical disciplines um, and for anthropologists alike. I'm therefore I'm delighted to, have, to be able to welcome today, after a series of historical um, papers, Professor Susanne Küchler uh, from the Department of Anthropology at the University, at, at University College London. Before I introduce Susanne, I just should briefly remind you that there are another two lectures coming in, in June, um, when in close succession, in the Wobeck Institute's François Kivigé and Tapatigua Kakurta um, from the University of Calcutta will speak. You'll find information about that about their lectures on our website, as well as links to recordings of earlier lectures. But now to today's speaker. Um, I'm delighted to introduce um, Susanne Küchler, uh, who studied at the Freie Universität in Berlin and at uh, King's... Uh, LSE. Correct, not at King's College, at the School of um, Economics and Political Sciences here in London. Um, and, held post, and held posts at the University of, of East Anglia and John Hopkins um, University Baltimore um, before joining UCL, where she was um, for many years also head of department uh, in, in anthropology. Um, Susanna's extensive anthropological field work, field work, work in Melanesia and in Eastern Polynesia led to a long-term and systematic research into collections of sculptures and ethnographic collections of these regions and a theoretical interest in the relationship um, between art and memory, vi visual analogy and transformation, material translation, intuition and empathy. She has worked on, an, uh, on a collaborative research project involving the British Museum and Goldsmith College Clothing the Pacific, which examines um, the take up and transformation of clothes and clothing introduced by missionaries and traders into the Pacific during the early 19th century. Um, research questions arising from examined in the European project, Sustainable Development in a Diverse World, 
which looked at the relationship between material aesthetics and the dynamics of transnational societies. Presently, Susanna works on an ethnographical exploration of the perception of motives in 21st century design and innovation as part of a um, research project on the relation between the business, um, fashion and textile, now part of an HRC funded project that is led by the London College of Fashion um, 2018 to um, 2023. Um, earlier this year, um, Susanne Küchler published together with Timothy um, Carroll, a return to the object, Alfred Gell, um, Art and Social um, Theory, um, a book that already in its opening pages directly engages with the founder of our institute, um, A.B. Warburg. And um, today, Susanne will speak to us about an anthropological perspective on festival, time, and the image. Susanne, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. So um, uh, I've been head of department for 10 years, quite unbelievably, and uh, only and, until about a year ago. So since then, or since 2018, I've been starting to publish to furiously all the stuff that had been built up. Um, and so uh, there's an edited book also coming out now with um, uh, Paolo Fortis. Can you hear me? Oh, that's fine. Paolo Fortis, um, which is a comparative, um, uh, ed a, a comparative perspective on Amerindian Melanesian societies uh, and the temporality of images. And it's called Time and Its Object will be out think at the end of next month. And I'm presently in the middle of writing um, a, a book which um, will be a radical kind of new take on what's known as uh, oceanic art, looking at it uh, as a model of uh, sequential flows and operations of complex systems. And so the talk today will sort of touch upon that. You can ask me later on. I will take you back <coughs> today as a concrete example to avoid um, being too uh, abstract. I will take you back to my uh, first extensive fieldwork site uh, in uh, island Melanesia, the Malangan, some of you have may heard about. And I will show you, unfortunately, I've got only some old pictures because I'm, I'm just in the process of getting all my photographs sort of digitized that will then go into the book. <coughs> so um, some of the images you will see later, but um, I have incorporated quite uh, a few images for you to have a look at. Um, so, let me start. In my talk here today, I will offer an anthropological perspective on the image, externalize, uh, the image has gone off, yes, oh, it's fine. fine, thank you. I will offer an anthropological perspective on the image, externalize this temporal object, which is in its manifold iterations and articulation a compass encompassed festival, itself a temporal object. As so many of you may be new to anthropology, just a brief reminder of what distinguishes the anthropological approach from other disciplines. Next slide, please. And here, the two next slides. Next slide, please. Hello? Thank you. Uh, the two next slides our text, this will not be uh, reoccurring in the remainder of the lecture. Anthropology classically applies the depth of focused perspective on relationships that can be best called biographical, replicating as far as possible the time perspective of agents. The specifically biographical depth of focus has also a spatial correlate as the spaces anthropology studies are the spaces traversed by agents in the course of their biographies. Second slide, please. As biographical relations are shaped by social norms, they are strategically navigated with as much ease and surety as one would plan and execute how to move about in space. To speak of the shape of biographical relations acknowledges the dependency of time maps upon externalizations of perceptions and practices of time that magically become what they express, as Roy Wagner, uh, anthropologist Roy Wagner, um, has written in 1986. The festival of which this le lecture speaks is as much a temporal object as its manifold figurative and non-figurative props, both gesturing to a temporal and relational landscape, thinkable and thus navigatable as indexical image. 
The anthropological perspective uh, reminds us of the methodological challenge, the recognition of the temporality of the image brings with it, when the attempt to reconstruct the totality of the image via its fragments distributed in space and time. The distributed image can only be studied when calibrating collection research with ethnographic observation in ways that acknowledges the art of attention at work, emulating the close observation and experience that temporal objects of all kinds demand. My contribution to your unfolding discussion about the festival and its objects is to highlight the methodological imperative of relearning this art of attention and the challenge it poses to our received understanding of objectification, not as explanatory framework for substitutionary relations of labor, but as framework for an understanding of something only thought can make manifest in the form of intersubjectively recognizable actions and artifacts, namely the logic of sequence that shapes our imagination of what is and will remain invisible, time itself. Much of contemporary thought on the nature and significance of the image has been shaped by the ideas of the art historian Abi Warburg, first defended as methodological imperative in 1912. Warburg's vision was of an alternative to what he called a panoramic view of history, comprised of chronologies, influences, and the occasional genius, to be replaced with a methodology that is sensitive to the image's own capabilities to extend itself in time. This other methodology, referred to by Warburg as capturing the images Nachleben, has become known in its translation as the survival of the image. The term, the term survival credits Warburg's methodological ideas exclusively with temporal connotations, yet fails to do justice to his encounter with an anthropology that shaped his interest in the necessity of the image and the role that it played in thought processes and in the constitution of the tradition. Barbuk's encounter with Navajo ritual performance and his personal acquaintance with anthropologists established in America by his meeting with Franz Boas and his familiarity with the 19th century writings of Edward Taylor are well known. Yet although D.D. Huberman's scholarship shows that Barbour's notion of survival draws upon the Taylorian anthropology, it, this does not lead to a reappraisal of the method implicit in the recognition that the image is akin to epic poetry in which all pasts are equally present. Crucial to my argument here today is that Warburg, arguably following Tyler as well as Boas, was not so much concerned with the reoccurrence of certain forms as with showing that the psychological efficacy of form or its capacity to abduct associations is intrinsic to the form itself, rather than a mere matter of response. Anthropology has built upon this insight by exploring the immanent relationality of the image with case studies that classically have emerged out of the social world of Oceania. Next slide, please. And this is an image uh, of Osinia, as you can see, and uh, the um, a rectangular um, uh, shapes are around the two areas where I worked um, in, uh, around uh, Island Melanesia and Polynesia. Um, so anthropology has built upon this insight by exploring the imminent relationality of the image with case studies that classically have emerged out of the social worlds of Oceania which have in common to challenge our received assumptions of how to theorize what George Simmel called the relation between the social forms of art and the art of social forms. Oceanic art resists an analysis that relies on interpretation and on the classification of form, requiring us instead to be attentive to the relations between forms as testimony of an understanding of how experiences and perceptions of time externalize an object form map upon a non-indexical image whose temporal nature manifests an imagined originating condition, itself, of course, a temporal phenomenon. It is important to note here that the clothing of the gap between the indexical image, our temporal object manifesting artifacts and in the sequences of actions that structure a festival, and the non-indexical image is not a matter of intuition and of substitution as Western notions of labor would have us assume, 
but of an art of attention involving the skilled adjustment or nuancing of the temporal object's relation to the image, drawing on experience and sustained observation. Next slide, please. A classic example of a kind of temporal object is Yap Micronesian stone money, famously analyzed by William Furness in the early years of the 20th century. The Micronesian islanders of Yap then had an economy based on large, solid, thick stone wheels called fei, ranging in size from between two feet uh, to 12 feet. Although fei were used to secure transactions, the stone wheels taken from quarries by canoe from islands outside Yap territory were never or rarely moved. This is because rather than serving as quasi-commodities and barter-like exchange, they serve to make manifest the potential for future transactions of the household. The measure of a stone wheel thus denoted not a relation to a hypothetical set of commodities that could be purchased with it. They were not mere stone coins, in other words, just of an unusual size, but were instrumental to a temporally structured system of credit bearing, credit bearing nature and credit clearing. A tangible and visible record past and future of outstanding credit, the seller enjoyed with the rest of Yap. The attention to scale as mode of differentiation of extension of credit is also underpinning island Melanesian shell money, although here it is the inverse as the smallest and most numerous disks strung together index the greatest extension temporally and spatially of credit. And you see some example of Melanesian uh, shell money there. Next slide. Differential scale is also critical to the production of Polynesian coverlets that are indispensable as record of credit enshrined in a complex system of genealogical relations. The size of the geometric pieces stitched together affects the number of times a pattern can be replicated within a given area. Um, that is here you see that in fact, it's one motivic element, one pattern. Uh, but you can imagine that if you shrink this, you actually can multiply it uh, eight times or 16 times. The more times you can replicate it across the surface, the smaller the individual pieces that are um, uh, stitched together, uh, the more um, valuable uh, the object, the more indicative of um, uh, the uh, uh, credit uh, that it literally makes manifest, uh, which is usually associated with the household. So this particular um, quilt is uh, actually was, uh, given by relatives to a uh, hotel. So you can see we were able to hang it up. Usually you will not see these quilts at all. They are uh, always held in, in uh, treasure trunks um, unless uh, they are moved, but they're rarely moved really. Um, they're sort of, you know, uh, light, but it's very similar to the Micronesian stone wheel. Um, uh, they're moved as a gesture, but not in actuality. We will come back, I will come back to this example later on. You may wonder what the differenti differentiated scale of the temple object has to do with the image extending itself in time. The image, as we are all well aware, is a paradoxical thing. It is unitary, so we imagine a stone wheel, and multiple as a stone wheel is recognized as a token of a relation of exchange. The basic compositional elements of identification, the, comp um, the combination of filled and empty circles in this case, speak to the elemental relations within the image and between the image and the objects upon which it comes to rest. Each object then, unique and total in itself, is also the complex composite of gestures intertextual and inter-artifactual relations that are already present as potential within the image. Objects thus are fundamentally always unsettling as they manifest this paradox of the idea of the multiple resting upon the fin uh, finitude of the one. The exper experiential dimension of the Cook Island piecework covenant demonstrates this collapsing of the one and the many in the process of its construction. 
soon, uh, sewn as it is into triangular sections, as I've indicated here with the red uh, lines going through um, the quadrangles. Uh, soon as it is into triangular sections, each composed of precisely measured geometric pieces, whose sequence is iteratively replicated across all sections, requires that women uh, sew evenly and with the same force of hand, as if they were one body, thus allowing for the imagined collapse of the apical ancestor and the present generation to be manifest in lived experience. It will come to no surprise that the geometry of the piecework coverlet is the key to the gene genealogical system and thus foundational to the social polity. And the skill of sewing correct patterns for coverlets is thus much guarded while being attended to by all ages with the greatest care. Next slide. This is just a little assemblage to have something on the screen you can look at. The image in Oceania is thus by definition temporal in nature, yet it is accessible only as folded time when it comes to rest in an external form to use a Deleuzean metaphor. At one level, we can see the image to be externalized in the totality of social actions comprising a festival, itself a temporal phenomenon with a beginning, middle and end. And yet at another level, the image's recursive folding leads to a plethora of object forms, including music, poetry, and dance, each drawing out in their composition the temporal relations imminent within the image. Critically, such compositions, even when stripped to their barest constituting parts, lend themselves for, uh, for anticipating future recursive assemblages that are resonant of the rhythmic and relational quality of the image. The image Warburg had in mind when developing his ideas of the new methodology is also present in the work of Walter, Walter Benjamin, where it captures in more or less material ways the rhythmic, relational, and transformational qualities of poetry and music alive in material translation. The temporal object as translation of the image enabled Sir Benjamin the thinking of the invisible. Hannah Arendt famously read Walter Benjamin as a poetic thinker who, like a diver searching for pearls, brings to the surface thought as fragments or immerwährende Urphenomena. Warburg's and Benjamin's capture of the temporal object as fragment testifies to the temporal quality of the image existing in thought alone and allows us to ask for the difference that such an idea of objectification makes to culture and society. Let us stay with the pearl for a moment. We know from Natasha Eaton's work that the pearl became synonymous with relations and forms of value that shaped the magical aspects of labor underpinning elite consumption in, in East India's British colonial visual economy. Benjamin's invocation of the pearl, a simple object, gesturing forward and backward in its association with the temporal landscape made accessible to experience, allows us to draw a comparison between the pearl and other self-similar multiple temporal objects that were collected in large numbers from societies living in the vicinity of the ocean for a similar kind of elite visual consumption. The artifacts we have in our collections from Oceania have been used much like the pearl to project a vision of a magical world synonymous with the idea of ritual in which concerns with complex operational systems and skilled observation and nuanced workmanship are uh, seemingly irrelevant. Quite the opposite, of course, is the case in that each and every temporal object, including the festival itself, has to map onto a temporal landscape for it to be engaged with purposefully and this requires attention to detail in the timing of action and the nuancing of the object or event so as to seamlessly replicate the idea of the image as temporal agent par excellence. Recent scholarship has begun to unpack the difference made by such a concept of labor that is guided not by an idea of substitution, but by a concern with the sequence specific to the workings of temporal 
events of complex operational entity and complex uh, operational entities. From ecological systems, age set systems, kinship systems, to systems managing the stratified and distributed use of land. Fluid groups of co-resident, co-working individuals, symptomatic of small scale societies across Oceania, have been shown to manage relations of trust and cooperation across vast networks via distributed fragments of the shared corpus of images. The temporal object and its relation to an image, however fragmentary this relation may be, matters here because the image is the network, not its transient expression. Societies in Oceania are famous for investing in prospective strategies that are predictable and reliable, sustained by a sense of paradigm certainty. Paradigm certainty is critical to the workings of gift-based political economies governed as they are by the principles of distribution. The nature of these distributive economies within which images do their work has been the subject of a now classic study by the geographer Tim Flannery on the ecology of Australasia and Oceania and its constraints upon the organization of political economies. His work entitled Future Eaters sets out to capture the distinctiveness of ideas that enabled the settlement of wider Oceania, directed as they are towards securing future returns of wealth via relations of credit based on relations of friendship and trust. Europeans, explains Flannery, came out of an environment conducive to the exercise and use of raw power, as the landscape was rich and extractable. By contrast, the flora, fauna, and human inhabitants of Australasia uh, had to learn how to, uh, it was scarce and uh, uh, not easily extractable. And human inhabitants of Australasia had to learn how to make a lot out of a little, to husband scarce resources by seeing how far they could be extended, rather than how quickly they could be extracted. It is now time to have a closer look at what this means for the relation between the festival, the temple object par excellence, and the many fragments that become one with that to which it gestures while moving independently of the festival. <coughs> Next slide, please. Um, this is a um, rather well, old slide. It's actually, um, there are two photographs taken from a collection of images uh, in Stuttgart, in the museum in Stuttgart, um, the top one uh, is uh, uh, in a, uh, a photograph of a uh, dance you can see on a platform performed uh, um, at um, sort of half stage, you will see in a minute, uh, ending uh, the morning of the dead. And at the bottom, you see a very famous image of the manga called the Soul Canoe. Uh, which is probably the largest Malangan figure ever collected. It's about um, seven meters long. And you can see, you can, yeah, uh, see it has, you know, lots of figures on it, which are uh, in later um, uh, collections actually in, appear individually. I will draw for you here today's sketch taken from my first extensive research into the Malangan of New Ireland an island northeast of Papua New Guinea, to outline the different ways in which the image, externalized at once in the temporal object of the festival, as a system of social action, and the effigy, that is an artifact, captures the periodicity and rhythm of processes whose interconnection, prediction, and recognition is essential for the distributive economy critical to this island's societies to work. Next slide. Uh, this is just an image of the island. You can see it is uh, very narrow uh, and long. Uh, Malangan is famous for the complexity of sequences of festivals and the extraordinary number of figurative objects assembled in Western collections. And it's important to note that the name refers to both festival and object alike. There are more than 25,000 Malangan figures carved from wood in museum collections worldwide. All are collected from the island of New Island, the northernmost end of the Bismarck archipelago. Uh, and even 
more so you can say that actually they have been collected only really from the northern part of the island. Uh, and they were collected all between roughly, so the, the largest number were collected between 1875 and 1930. There's much, there's much fewer artifacts collected thereafter, um, uh, partially because of the cessation of merchant shipping uh, in the area. Just to give you a little bit of a background into the history uh, of this island and uh, and into my theory as to how and why the Malanga system as we know it, know of it today, uh, started actually rather swiftly um, and unsuspectedly uh, from a different system that existed before. Round about uh, 1870, between 1870, 1860 and 1870, already in 1840, um, the island's coastal uh, areas were populated with large uh, foreign-owned plantations. Uh, and the islanders had to retreat into the center, which is very steep rising up. So it's not very good for having guidance. Uh, it's not very good, not a really hospitable uh, uh, area. Um, and in order to overcome the acute land shortage people found themselves you know, with, um, the system of Malangan, as, we, uh, as I will describe it, which is essentially a system of distributing uh, rights to land so you can own land in many different uh, locations and uh, in a highly differentiated way. So in some locations you might just own um, you know, rights to fish in the lagoon, in others you can harvest the nut-bearing trees, in others you can have a plot in somebody else's garden and, and so it grows. And um, this, uh, literally, people are constantly in the, on the move in order to attend to their various kinds of land, uh, uh, plots of land uh, they have all over the place. There are fascinating parallels between the performative role of these figures, uh, made as effigies, and the description of effigies used in the performances accompanying the funerals of medieval French and English kings described by the historian Alice Kantorowicz. Similar to the medieval effigies that stood in for and were treated as if they were the king's body until the successor had been announced, separating the office of kingship from the mortal body of the king and thus establishing the notion of the social body composed of officers and institutions that then came to form the foundations of the modern state. The Malangan effigy affects the separation of a form of land ownership centered on a structured system of distributed usufructory rights to land from the mortal personage of present title holders. It is always the death of an elder which initiates the process of transfer of rights and responsibilities towards usufructory resources and their distribution. The way this happens is again very similar to the medieval case study described by Kantorowicz. But here, the effigy, a general likeness that captures the idea of the social body rather than a physical likeness with a deceased person, makes manifest of three named images whose fragments are distributed across the island, connecting those that can make an acceptable likeness, that's the actual translation of the word malangan, with each other in extended land and wealth holding units. The image is talked about as being like a water well or spring, flowing ceaselessly on, always the same, yet different every time you look. A child is named after one of the three images, uh, many names. So the three images have many names, as many names, you know, it just as many names as literally uh, physical artic articulations have been produced and are remembered. And the name given to the child also rises it to initiate the making of the effigy associated with the image later on in life. The child is assumed to grow into an adult who will both issue forth many instantiations of the image. It has been given by its name, folding the image into as many objects as possible to give them to others in exchanges for help with the ritual work for the dead, as well as for access to rights to harvest fruit carrying trees, fish in the lagoon, and plant plots in someone else's garden in as many different places as possible. As one's own image fragments and moves, 
a foothold in the network marked by other images is constantly sought, acquiring rights to reproduce fragments and reassembling their compositional vocabulary, social amnesia permitting. So if, for example, a particular, you know, these uh, groups organized on a clan basis with so a particular clan, subclan in a village um, dies out, they're matrilineal because uh, uh, not having given uh, birth to uh, female offspring, uh, others will try and take over the images of that particular um, subclan if they can. A dominant household and village will thus be active in either their own funerary rituals, festivals, as well as attending to a large number of different stages of festivals happening elsewhere. Temple objects, whether a festival or an effigy, require a huge investment of time and attention to detail, from the tending and harvesting of gardens for just-in-time delivery of produce, or the careful timing of the carving work itself, staged with other utter precision, right to the end. The image people use to discuss the folding and unfolding of time in effigies is binding, using the knot as an object to think through the transformations an image is undergoing during the sequence of unfolding and refolding. And here just uh, another slide. And this slide I'm, is presently being withdrawn digitally. Um, it's actually really quite old, but it shows the different stages uh, that um, uh, uh, fest festival stages that um, really go from the burial through to the Malangan. Malangan's, Malangan is a generic name for a secondary burial and the third and final stage of a process which is completing the work for the dead is a sequence of festivals that commenced with a burial, tracing the transformation of the body alongside the transformation of the social fabric of the living from which the deceased person is plucked. The temporal transformation of the body is traced spatially by successive enclosures used for the staging of sequences or festivals. Uh, next slide, please. The first enclosure surrounds the house within which the body was allowed to rest prior to burial. This being years later, the enclosure within which the carving of Mangan, absorbing the soul of the deceased, to complete the transformation from the body natural to the social body will take place. Uh, so you will see, I will show you different enclosures now. Uh, they are in fact around different spaces, but you must imagine that they are always, the enclosures are always around the same space. Uh, so um, this image here was uh, uh, taken at the end of my field work when uh, an elder who um, uh, had passed away and he had already been living in this house. Uh, he was declared a kind of uh, living dead person uh, and he had moved, been moved to, to a newly built house uh, in which he lived for about a year uh, until he passed away. And then immediately following his death, the enclosure was built and years later, the Malangan ceremony um, uh, will take place in, in this particular enclosure. Next slide, please. Right. Um, so the first enclosure, which we just saw, saw the greatest number of festivals every single, as every single produce um, that, that ripens of the, uh, grown in within the garden or along the roadside by the deceased person will need to be uh, consumed ritually by the extended fa family inside the enclosure. And this can be literally events that happen every week. So at every weekend, everybody in the whole island is on the road traveling to one of these small, many, many small um, festivals. The same space now is the, uh, is surrounded with the new enclosure, the second enclosure, which we see here which is the scene for the festival marking the termination of mourning, acting out the eradication of the last traces of the, of the deceased's labor and the anticipated transformation of the soul into the pantheon of birds personifying the world of the ancestral. The final, next slide. The final enclosure surrounding the same space is visually impermeable and used to keep the carver's hut hidden from you. The carver's hut you actually see on the left hand corner. This is an image uh, taken actually of the Malangan house, of course, after the reveal of 
uh, the, all the, uh, the fences have been taken down, people are inside, food is already distributed. Uh, so it's towards the end of the actual festival uh, itself. During the final night when the effigy is thought to be alive, it is transferred onto the graveyard, which likewise is surrounded with a thick screen of coconut palm leaves, which are pushed inside by the waiting crowds the moment the songs of Malangan appear as if from within the effigy. As soon as the crowds rush forward into the enclosure, they line up in family groups and throw money and show money at the base of the effigy, thus effectively removing its image, which is moved over to the group who, held, uh, who will hold it as its fragments as token of access to the use of land. All of this is anticipated as the fragment of the image made visible in the effigy matches precisely the degree of access to land now granted. The effigy is now considered dead and is taken to the forest or uh, to be left to rot or to a mission to be sold to foreigners. Um, in fact, uh, really because there are so few foreigners there, uh, the missions have rather a number of objects and they're you know, periodically all taken back into the forest because uh, it is, uh, you know, no longer do you have big ships coming by uh, and ship captains kind of looking for these things to, uh, to take back to museums. Next slide. As a festival, Mangan is structured as a process of staging the absorption, containment and release of the soul of the deceased. Is the image of the body social, the effigy, taking central stage, inverting the process from burial um, to the end of mourning, which is marked with a sequence of festivals that dramatizes the dismantling of the social body and the separation of titles and offices from the body natural. The sequence of the ritual process are made manifest in the form given to images uh, by virtue of discrete motivic elements that serve as active operators and passive connectors of an assemblage of motivic elements. So you can see here, um, uh, this is the kind of absorption, you will see more images of that in a minute, absorption, containment and release. And these are identified, you know, these, these particular kinds of motivic elements allow you to identify what you're dealing with. In fact, this particular one uh, element down here, the operational element, is, looks like phases, but uh, in fact, it is um, quite the opposite um, uh, to a feather. It is actually uh, associated with a particular seasonally occurring phenomenon in the ocean uh, called, called the palolo worm, the lighting of the palolo worm, which is a fluorescent kind of um, light emitted uh, by this creature uh, once a year, you have it even in Los Angeles, it occurs wherever the palodo worm is uh, found and it gathers for mating in the lagoon. And uh, the uh, appearance of this palodo worm and its you know, a, a light on the surface of the ocean is really the signal uh, of uh, the start of the year. It's known as the starting of the year and particularly the starting of the thinking about planning a Malangan festival. So what you have here is an image of the ending uh, of uh, the ritual of the festival itself is actually also, you could say, uh, synonymous with the beginning, thinking about the beginning of a planning of the planning of a fest for, for a festival. Uh, so you can argue it's a kind of typical cyclical way of, of thinking about uh, time if you want to have it that way. So the tripartite structure tracing the temporal sequence of absorption, containment and release dramatized in the Malangan festival itself also underpins the dimensional articulation of the form the image can assume. Next slide. So here you see absorption and you have very much following almost the structure of the house, but it's more complex than that. It's also assumed to be different kind of transformations of the knot, uh, you know, you know and different, different types of knots, but also transformations of one knot in different, into different di dimensions. Um, uh, you have a vertical articulation and then you can 
uh, projected out into horizontal um, uh, or simply take individual elements, which is the kind of figurative sculpture here, and or again, horizontal in this way. So it just shows you how kind of you can carry out transformations which are still recognizable and following a very particular kind of schema. Next one. Um, this is uh, uh, the image that is associated with the central part of the festival, the moment when uh, the, the figure is, uh, the effigy is fully carved, painted, is thought to be alive, uh, really only the afternoon, the late afternoon of the very final day. Um, it uh, then is moved over um, into the adjacent space, uh, uh, into another enclosure where, where it is then really put into a house ready to be uh, revealed the following day. The night um, in which the figure is, the effigy is thought to be alive is, uh, you could say, a kind of ritual um, of inversion. So people kind of uh, dress up, but also fundamentally invert their relations to one another, which uh, is this is a kinship-based society which has very strict rules around who can sit and who can talk, uh, can sit next to women, who can talk directly with whom, uh, with other people. Um, and you are able to transgress during that night these particular um, uh, rules of kinship and a great deal of laughter and, and uh, et cetera is um, uh, the norm. Um, as well as dances, which are interestingly circular around a, um, a garment, a slit drum, and uh, accompanying the circular dance, which uh, has a very particular kind of uh, step, um, imitating uh, a wave-like motion, uh, which everybody has to, to follow, a very slow wave-like motion, almost hypnotic. Um, in, uh, in its execution are, are songs which are only heard at that particular time. And those songs are said to be of a language that uh, pe you know, people can't understand, but the, these songs are sounds, great gusto, and are known by everyone. And there's a great reveling, but part of sort of wanting to attend a um, uh, festival is so you can sing this song. The other time you, of course, hear um, these songs is uh, when just the moment before the uh, Malangan figure is actually uh, revealed to the crowds gathering outside, outside the enclosure. Um, and when it is a, a thought to actually come from the, within the effigy itself, but it is, of course, sung usually by the female um, relatives uh, of the uh, kinship group that has officiated the carving of um, the effigy. Um, so rather complex, but I hope you understand the relation between the kind of um, fragmenting of the image into temporal objects and the structure of the ritual itself. And the next one, please. Um, this one is the final, um, uh, synonymous with the final stage, but as I said, also in a sense with the beginning of the planning of the Malangan. So the final stage of the Malangan is not the feasting as such, so not the um, you know, distributed, distribution of food, etc. That of course is the high point of the day as well. Uh, but in fact, it, it uh, culminates uh, in the very early hours of the next morning, um, just before um, sunrise, everybody gathers uh, on uh, the beach and has to wash uh, ritually. So you have to wash very carefully this particular kind of leaves that are thought to purify the skin um, because the... Uh, contact with the Malangan, which particularly in its alive stage is thought to be highly contaminating, polluting. And if you are not uh, thoroughly kind of cleansing yourself, you are um, likely to uh, be literally, uh, uh, you know, haunted by uh, the souls of the dead. 
um, and of course succumb to illness. Um, uh, and uh, so the, the critical piece of um, the figures that are associated with this very final stage of the Malangan uh, is here the palula worm, which looks like a feather, and of course the faces of the birds. And birds again that are appearing in um, these kinds of figures of um, uh, the hornbill, uh, that is birds that uh, um, hunt in the early hours of the morning. And so uh, the, very much the beginning of the day, as well as the beginning of the year, the beginning of the planning, the beginning of thinking about Malangan is in fact also the ending of the festival itself. Um, I hope that this is quite clear and I hope you can see how in fact um, the, uh, the image itself, which is of course absent, uh, it is in fact only really living in thought, in dreams at the very best, um, is uh, made manifest in objects that are uh, themselves playing on the, on the, which are playing on the relation they have with one another. And if you go into, if you're very familiar with these collections, you can um, see connections between different uh, uh, figures, different figures. Um, uh, and you can see that actually there must have been consecutive um, uh, 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 carvings or uh, productions related, you know, to the same, um, exactly the same group, but this is, you know, not so significant, potentially. So each fragment of a name image is thus the witness of transactions of rights to land, projecting forward the possible future extensions of a rhizomatic leasehold network, within which resources are distributed and wealth accumulated over time. Thus, like the Malangan image, the leasehold network is under constant construction, held together by the logic underpinning both images and their evolving qualities. It would be a mistake, however, to assume that the attention is solely directed to the image and its folding into discrete and yet connected temporal objects, both festivals and artifacts alike. Like the festival itself, which is both singular and yet multiple, comprised of sequences of actions, that mark the spaces bound up with the biography of the recently departed. The image is both singular in its articulation and an effigy, and yet multiple in its capacity to be reassembled, gesturing forward and backward in time with an open-ended stock of motivic elements whose specific relation to named images is expanded upon in narratives. I have tried to present a snapshot of Malangan, its folding of time into temple objects that make manifest reversible and iterative sequences. The image is experienced only as fragment, yet each fragment manifests the temporal quality of the image in its totality. Dispersed and yet continuous within the life cycle of persons, the inherent temporality of the image connects also the many different small and large festivals that allow time to be strategically navigated. Malangan, we have seen, is both a system of social action and a temporal object, and thus allows in more than one way to conceptualize the permutations of the social polity, which like a melody is inherently recognizable while open-ended in its articulations. And here I finish.